Um, I've only got 20 minutes, or slightly over now, to tell you about something I've been obsessing about for quite a few years now. Um, it's a bit of a different uh, sort of uh, uh, flavour to Mark's talk, whereas Mark is very precise and very mathematical and very correct. Mine's a bit more gung ho, slightly more random. Um, but hopefully, you'll find it as interesting as I do when I get to the nitty gritty. So, what I've been interested in for some time now is how pathogens of insects or invertebrates have been able to evolve over the historical evolution uh, time periods to become insects of mammals and indeed of man. Uh, the model organism I'm going to talk to you about here is something called Photoaptosae symbiotica, which I'm sure none of you really have, would have heard of, um, apart from a few people that have known me in the past. And, um, well, let's begin with it. Does this? No. Okay. Okay, so I'll introduce you to the Photoaptosae. So before I start, um, I just want you to sort of to set the scene. Um, you've got to think about, and you saw on one of Mark's first slides, the sort of the history of life on Earth. So for huge periods of evolutionary time, there was really nothing but bacterial, in terms of bacterial infections, and invertebrates. Mammals and vertebrates didn't come on the scene until far more recently. So a lot of the early evolution of virulence and sort of pathogenicity would have gone on between these early bacterial pathogens and their invertebrate hosts. So this has provided a sort of reservoir, if you like, a starting point for a lot of the modern virul mammalian virulence factors. And this is kind of where my thinking is coming from. So I'll introduce you to Photoaptus. It's a bioluminescent member of the Enterobacteriaceae. Now, I'm not that much of a non-biologist to know that that's a nematode and not a bacteria. But the bacteria are carried in the gut of an insect pathogenic or entomopathogenic pathogenic um, nematode worm called Heteroditis that lives in the soil. This worm, this is C. elegans, by the way, but I couldn't find a picture of Heteroditis crawling around. Um, this is a Heteroditis. On its, on its mouth, it's got a little tooth that it uses to scratch its way into an insect host it finds in the soil. Once it's in, to the insect. This is a movie done by a guy called Todd Cheech, which uh, doesn't work on Mark's computer. Let's try one more time. Oh, well, if it did, what you would see... You've got the movie in the file. It's, it's not important. What you would see is the worm crawling around and GFP-level bacteria coming out of its mouth. So it gets into the insect and it vomits up the bacteria into the open blood system of the insect. Only about 100 cells ever get into an insect, and some insects can be quite large. Uh, these few bacterial cells are able to completely resist the very potent innate immune system of an insect, very rapidly kill the insect, producing a battery of different toxins. And there they bioconvert the tissues of the insect into more bacteria. So basically this is being used like a biological weapon by the nematode to kill the insect and convert more bacteria, which the nematode itself then eats. Now the reason I've boxed this in red... This is the point at which when the insect's dead, it starts to bioluminesce. We don't know why it does that, and there's various theories, but maybe some clues coming later. Um, but also, this is all happening in the soil. So the soil is a very dirty environment, a lot of saprophytes, a lot of scavenging organisms in there. And so the bacteria produces a massive battery of uh, small drug-like molecules and antimicrobials. So it's a great source for hunting down uh, novel drugs, and we've been doing that on an EU grant, and we've got about 400 novel compounds from this and a close genera alone. I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, the nematode begins its replication under the control, the sexual development of the nematode is being controlled by the bacteria, which in itself is also interesting, until the insect resources are exhausted, lots of bacteria, lots of nematodes, they then reassociate. And one of the, each little line here is a nematode, a heteroptitic nematode, and this is an in, a, a Galeria insect larvae. It ruptures and hundreds of thousands, if not millions of, of nematodes then emerge from a single infection. So you can see here this is a very efficient uh, symbiosis of pathogens with the bacteria and the nematode working together to be an absolutely lethal um, killing machine, if you like. Because of this, they've been used for some time now uh, uh, by industry, by agriculture, as crop protection agents. They're, they're biocontrol agents. You can spray them on fruit trees, mushroom uh, things, uh, turf. If you play golf, a lot of turf uh, is treated with these things. And so they're sold all over the world. This one uh, is a German company. Uh, they called it Enema. I think they lost some kind of translation there, not realizing that they call their company Enema. But anyway, they thought that's quite funny. Um, so while they're useful, uh, there's also a dark side to this bioluminescent bacteria. And that is that uh, there's been several cases reported of infections by photoadvocates, this photoadvocating biotica. And what you have is these horrible 
ulcerating lesions and normally on the extremities of the body. Um, and it's important here to realise that these aren't like a pseudomonas or a staph. It's not an opportunistic infection. Photoabdus is the only bacteria in these infections, so it's the sole agent of this horrible um, ulcerating infection. So there were notice back in 1989 in the USA, and more recently we were getting isolates from Australia. So where? Where do you find it? Well, this is where it's found on some, some of the patients. You find an initial foci of infection. These are these red dots on extremities. And then you, it goes back to remic, and it re-emerges a bit like plague. You get sort of bubo-like swellings all over the body, and they rupture these ulcers. So um, God knows what this chap was up to here, but he's someone got it in his crotch. Um, but that's where it happens kind of on the body. That's its sort of clinical uh, manifestation, if you like. And where they've been found in the world is the east coast of Australia and the US, and also down in Texas, there's quite a lot. <laughs> now, we're not, they're not entirely restricted to these two continents, because we also have an isolate we got from Nepal, and also one we captured ourselves from the soil in Thailand. So they're not restricted to these continents, but maybe this is only where it's being reported. But this isn't like plague, this isn't some kind of global killer, it's a model system to understand how insect pathogens may be able to evolve into a human pathogenic state. Um, so how, how, what have we been doing to try and understand this, this, this transition, this molecular adaptation that's allowing this jump from an insect into a human? So really, it can, the talk can be split into four different sections. So first of all, we looked at the phylogeny, which is more Mark stuff, and some comparative genomic studies. Then we did some functional genomic studies, a process called rapid virulence annotation, which I'll briefly take you through. Then we also looked at the change in the virulence strategy of what the bacteria would do in an insect compared to a human uh, conditions, as it were. Obviously, we can't affect humans in the lab deliberately. Um, and then we move on to what we've been doing more recently, which is the systems biology studies to sort of look at the, the bigger picture and changes in gene regulation as it would if it's facing an insect or a human. So this, unlike one of Mark's beautiful trees, is an incredibly boiled down, distilled, diagrammatic version of the genus of Photoabdus. So what we essentially have, just for simplicity's sake, is three species. We've got Photoabdus temporata and luminescence. These are both insect-only pathogens. They've only ever been found in insect infections. And then we have the asymbioticas in this expanded central region. There's obviously many isolates on each of these. Um, and interestingly, we also have a group of the asymbiotica genetically asymbiotica, but they're only insect restricted. So a good close outgroup there for our human pathogenic strains. Um, we've now recently sequenced with a mice seek, not Mark's mice seek, but another one, source biosciences, uh, several genomes now. So all the ones boxed in color, we have genome sequences for. So we're starting to get a feel for the comparative genomics of what makes up this, this genus. This was originally done with a nine gene MLSP with Ed Farl and, and Harold Ockman, actually. So this is a stylized version of that. We don't have no idea about the molecular clock, so we can't tell you when these things branched off. I mean, we, as Mark pointed out, clearly, something with an old lifestyle like this as well may have a very unusual molecular clock. We've no idea. Howard Ockman estimated 10 million years ago, but I really don't believe that. Um, so what we are trying to do is to find out what adaptations, what has changed, what has allowed these insect pathogens to do this human pathogenic activity. Well, one clue, and quite a, quite a strong clue, I think, in this case, is that all of the non-clinical isolates will die, the bacteria, if you try and culture them. You can culture them away from the nematode in the laboratory, uh, just like you can with many enterobacteria here. Uh, they will all die if you try and take them above 34 degrees. So these are temperature-restricted pathogens. That's why they only really get insects in the environment. All the clinical ones can grow at 37 degrees or even up to 45 degrees in one isolate. So these are far more temperature-tolerant. So... That kind of makes sense, right? There's no way you could be infecting a human, going back to emic passing through the core of the body, if you got killed above 34 degrees. So these necessarily have to be able to evolve tolerance to that temperature. Um, so we're looking at the comparative genomics here. Anybody that's used to using things like Artemis comparison tool, which this is a display of, uh, what you see there is three genomes. You've got an Australian called Hinkslip isolate genome here of a human pathogenic strain, the American one that we first sequenced and an insect-restricted one from Trinidad and Tobago. And wherever there's a line, there's basically homology. The blue bit just means that region's flipped. It's still homologous. And so when we did this, initially, we only had three genomes. Now we've got a lot more. Um, we realized, actually, there's very few genetic differences between the human pathogenic strains and the insect strains. 
we were hoping to see very obvious large gene cluster differences. Didn't look like that. They looked very much like the same beast. So slightly confounded. Didn't help us that much. Although we hadn't analyzed it in the level we should do it yet, I don't think. Um, so we thought, okay, well, how can we see what the functional difference is? So let's do some functional genomic uh, comparisons between what these two genomes are capable of, the insect restricted and the human uh, tolerant. So we developed this while for actually just for looking for virulence factors, something called rapid virulence annotation, uh, which is a very quick and dirty approach, but it works. And what you do is you take a large insert genome library of your pathogen, in this case, Photorabdus. You clone, say, a cosmoid library. You array them all into microtiter plates. You then, at great cost and nagging various people at the Sanger, you end sequence each cosmoid clone and then map them back onto the genome to make sure your coverage is good. There's always going to be gaps. You're always going to get unclonable regions, but generally, so for an average library of 16 plates, that's pretty good coverage there. And then what you do is you take each individual clone, or when I say you, what you do is you get undergraduate students to take each individual clone and test them against four different taxa. So in this case, we've got a C. elegans feeding model, so you take a clone, put a puddle on the plate, feed it to a nematode. Does it kill the nematode, yes or no? Same thing with amoeba, the cancer amoeba polyphagia in this case. Can the amoeba feed off it, or is it toxic, yes or no? You inject it into insects. In this case, this is a Manduca sexta uh, uh, tobacco hornworm, crop pest. Nice and juicy. You can inject plenty into those to test whether there's any virulence factors against insects. And finally, you take your clone, you lyse it, you overlay it onto mammalian macrophage tissue culture, and then use a viability stain to see if there's anything in there that the, the macrophage doesn't like. Are there any mammalian-specific macrophage toxins, if you like, in there? So you test each clone against those four taxa. And then you correlate the data, and you say, okay, well, here's a representation of the genome. It's an old figure now. Uh, we have here a bunch of regions containing virulence factors that are toxic to macrophages, to insects, amoeba, nematodes. So you get this layer cake of different toxic regions, if you like. And then you compare that to the annotation that you can do from sequence gazing and say, does anything make sense? So have we got anything, for example, that's specifically mammalian toxic compared to insect toxic or whatever? So that's what we call rapid virulence annotation. And unfortunately, when we did it for the human pathogenic strain, the US1, I would say we, when Maria uh, Sanchez Contreras, who was my postdoc at the time, also did, I did that one, she did this one. When you compare them, actually, disappointingly, there's no obvious major toxin differences. So again, in reflecting the genomic similarity, these things look like the same beast. They're encoding the same toxins that seem to have the same effects on the same different taxa. So we've got here, still, we've still got the mystery, so we've got here a human pathogenic isolate, an insect pathogenic isolate. Bearing in mind, the human pathogenic isolate is also an insect pathogen as well. So it may not be a great surprise that it's got all the same insect toxin genes, if you like, uh, that, it's, that it's, its insect-restricted cousin has. And so that's what we saw anyway. So nothing jumped out there. A few minor differences and things we've worked on, but nothing too obvious. So... That leaves us the question, okay, if we can't see it that way, how are they behaving in their virulence strategy? I have to try this. There we go, that's better. So when we inject, this is GFP-labeled um, E. coli into a Drosophila embryo now. So this was done with a guy called Will Wood, and Isabella Vizdu uh, was my and his postdoc. Um, and we were injecting Drosophila mel uh, melanogaster embryos, so tiny little things, with labeled bacteria, and then making confocal microscope movies of what happened to the hemocytes. The hemocytes here are like the insect neutrophil equivalents, and they're labeled in red. And what you see, you inject E. coli, the hemocytes are following a developmental program. They come off their midline, and they go after the E. coli, they snatch it, and they kill it. So they're working as immune cells as well as developmental cells. Contrast, you inject photorabdus, there's only six cells in this one embryo, and within 20 minutes, this took to get to this point, they've completely frozen and overridden the immune system. So just six cells is enough to completely kill the whole animal in this case, the, the embryo, will not kill it, but to completely disable the immune system. So they sit outside the cells, they just secrete toxins, and they, they, they sort of essentially override the immune system that way. Now, the alternative, just because I like looking at that picture. So actually, when you, when you challenge mammalian cells with them, actually the asymbiotic will get inside there and are sitting in the intracellular niche. So there we've got a very clear difference in virulence strategy between the two hosts. Um, very likely a reflection of escaping from all the, the, the immune serum proteins in a mammal or in a human that they don't want to get exposed to. 
So they quickly get inside a cell and they sit there nicely. Um, so that's a big difference. So they do behave differently when you challenge an insect or a, a mammalian host with them. So they were nice and embedded, but not anymore. Now, actually, when we go back to the genome sequences, we can see that these, these you can identify certain toxins, certain uh, secreted effectors which correlate with intracellular life cycles. And actually, we can see that these human pathogenic strains do indeed have effectors that would allow this sort of behavior. So we're going back to the genome a little bit there. Now, what we did find very interesting is that when we took our, uh, in a, how long have we got? 10 minutes. 10 minutes, that's fine. So when we took a, um, an insect infection model and we injected this case, it's the Manduka sexta horn, uh, uh, hornworm again, you inject that with photoadverse and you put it at two temperatures, you put it at 28 degrees or 37, at 28 degrees, the photoadverse wipes the floor with the insect within two days as expected, 38 to 37 degrees, the infection completely fails. So increasing the temperature to the mammalian temperature completely attenuates the insect infection. So I initially thought that, that it would be virulent against insects, virulent against uh, mammals, and it would just use the same stuff. Apparently there is a difference when you shift temperature, and it can't be an insect pathogen when it's jumped to a mammal. So what is the temperature? In this case, the only difference here is the temperature. So we can focus on that for the moment. So what is the temperature increase doing to the bacterial gene regulation, which, of course, is virulence factors. It's also metabolic abilities, which is very important, which we'll come to. So how do we get to that? Well, we do something like this, what I'm, talk what I'm calling a systems biology study, where we're looking, essentially, at the changes in gene regulation initially at the two temperatures, although we've done a lot more since. So we take our symbiotica, we grow it just literally in LB, 28 and 37. We sequence the transcriptome, so we do an RNA-seq analysis to see what its gene transcription is doing. We did digestial protein expression analysis to see what proteins it's making from that RNA. And then we do something called a phenoarray to look at what it can actually do metabolically at the two temperatures. And hopefully, at the end of all that, we synthesize all this knowledge together to make an evolutionary or mechanistic model of how it's behaving at the two temperatures and why it's behaving like that at the two temperatures. So condensing about 10 slides into just one, here's uh, the global RNA-seq data, what we end up with, and here's just four conditions. We actually have 24 conditions with various bloods and all sorts of things now, but to keep it simple. So here we've got the genome at 28 degrees exponential phase, 37 at exponential phase, 28 at stationary phase, 37 at stationary phase. And wherever you've got a colored spike, uh, this is transpacific, so reds on one strand, greens on the other, that's where you've got transcription. So this is the whole genome zoomed out, here's all the open reading frames, so we can see exactly what all the genes are doing under those conditions at the transcriptional level. Now, if any of you are familiar with RNA-seq, it's absolutely fantastic, and I know some people here in the new division are planning to do it, and they definitely should. Uh, it gives you a set global map of what all of the transcriptions do. Small regulatory RNAs, which Emma's going to tell you about. Um, it gives you antisense transcripts, which you wouldn't normally see. It shows you transcription start points, differential upper one regulation, all sorts of stuff. Very powerful, tons of data. And what you can do is you can use a program called DSEC, which will compare any one open reading frame or any one region between different conditions and give you a statistically supportive difference to say, yes, this gene really is different under these conditions at this probability level. So you can get really good comparative statistical data out of this. The same, to some extent, the same thing with the proteomics. So we, again, from the, the same biological samples, we did the RNA-seq, we also did the proteomics, so we can correlate them directly from the same sample. We uh, used, so for three biological replicates, replicates for each condition, and then you use, this was done by the Cambridge Proteomics Facility, you can use the program, it's called Decider, and what it does is for each spot, it's got your three conditions, it plots them as an intensity spot, and then says, yes, re these on average are really different, because proteomics suffers from a, a replication problem, you know, being able to replicate between it. So that, again, gives you what it considers statistically significant supported differences in protein. So two very big, very useful data sets at this point. Now, once you've got your gene lists of what is different under the two conditions, you, it's quite hard to sift through that by looking at Excel tables. What you can do is you can use something like a uh, network analysis like this. So it's a program on the web called String, where you paste in your list of genes that are differentially expressed, and it plots this kind of crazy drunken spider kind of approach. But that is actually more useful than it looks on first sight, because you can say, well, actually, these genes here are all to do with secreti secreting of proteases. These genes here, actually, these are all 
clustered together, they're all motility genes. So these are the chemotaxis flagella expression. So it starts moving when you take the temperature up. Other, and we, we know that from classic microbiology. We can see that it moves, it swarms. But what we didn't know, for example, is this very strong cluster here is actually showing a very strong vitamin B12 dependence when you put the temperature up. So you can start to pick out all this cryptic stuff you wouldn't have seen just because it visually shows it in a very approachable and accessible way. So, we, of course, we can do that for... Oops. We can do that for upregulated, downregulated, with, without, human blood, insect blood, whatever. So I'm sifting through lots of these sort of things at the minute. So we've looked at our gene regulation in terms of RNA and proteome. Uh, the, now, the more important thing, I think, uh, and this is what a lot of sort of studies lack, is what it really can and actually can't do at 37 degrees versus 28. So the metabolic changes. Now, again, another advance, another, po another omics, if you like, is this metabolomic sort of approach, which is something, uh, there's a, I don't know if you're aware of it, there's a, there's a machine made by Biolog, uh, well, Omniolog or Biolog, whatever they're called, and what it consists of is you get microtiter plates, and each well you have a different metabolite. So this is a carbon plate, for example, so it'll have things like glucose, different sugars, uh, a tween, all sorts of different potential carbon sources. Um, and then what you do is you put your bacteria, you seed your bacteria into it, and then grow it in the machine under different conditions, and it looks for the ability of the bacteria to use that as a, for respiration. So it's what it, whether, can it use that metabolite or not. So we tested templates under two different conditions, looking at carbon sources, nitrogen sources, blah de blah de blah pH differences, to see what it can do or can't do at those two temperatures. We also supplemented that and confirmed it using classical microbiology. This was done by a uh, postdoc of mine called Jay Mully, whose heroic effort, really, one, in getting this working in the first place, because we didn't know about the vitamin problem, but two, just to do hundreds of plates in and aerobic jars and indicators everywhere. So she did a huge amount of effort, but it, but it complemented and, and backed up a lot of this data. So what it showed us is that, to our surprise, it becomes, it becomes almost disabled at 37 degrees. You think it would be a vicious human pathogen. It becomes very disabled. It gets very restricted into what it can use as carbon and nitrogen sources. So it can only use asparagine, glutamate, or glutamine as the sole source of carbon and nitrogen at 37 degrees. 28, it can use anything. Uh, it can't use sugars at 37, none of the other amino acids. And it switches from oxidative phosphorylation respiration to predominantly fermentative respiration metabolism at 37. So this thing becomes incredibly, incredibly very restricted, very disabled at 37 degrees. So, well now we're getting to our sort of synthesis of the model, if you like, of trying to work out what's really going on. So we have our genomes. We can look using KEG pathway predictions at what it should be able to do. What enzymes has it got? What should it be able to do? We can predict that. We can use the phenoarray data to say what it can actually do at the higher temperature, because they don't always correlate. And then we can use the RNA-seq and the proteomics to see what it's trying to do. Okay, so we're kind of coming at it from all angles here. And once we've looked at all that together, which I can assure you is no mean feat trying to juggle it all together at the same time, we can look for, for example, is there evidence that it's deliberately up and down regulating certain pathways? Maybe it's more efficient in a human host to not make pyrimidine or whatever, because we see things like that. Is it, is it not a good idea to be using carbohydrates in a human host? Is it not a good idea to be using anything but these amino acids? So is it deliberately changing its behavior? Or, which I'm favoring at the moment, are we seeing that pathways are failing because it doesn't like being at 37 degrees? Because it's evolved to be an insect pathogen at ambient temperature. It somehow found itself in a mammalian niche. Half the pathways are failing, and it's getting around it somehow. So is it a deliberate or sort of accidental human pathogen, if you like? So we can synthesize this sort of model. Um, so as I said, when you shift it to 37, the carbohydrate metabolism stops, and you can see things like the maltose transporters and, and operon, things like using multos is, is something that the, the normal strains use a lot. That no longer becomes an option to it, and we can see it shuts these down. On the other hand, because it needs these three amino, acid, three amino acids, it increases secretion and production of a secreted protease, PRTA. It increases importers of peptides and amino acids. So that goes out, chews stuff up, and sucks it back in. It then increases metabolism or the metabolic pathways that produce asparagine, which is the one amino acid it really likes. That's the one it grows best on. So it's pushing its whole biochemistry towards generating that, which then gets sent off to help it live, essentially. 
And also we see the flagella operon comes on and blah, blah, blah. So we can start to build these mechanistic models as to what's really happening. Now, we think this is quite nice because this business with it requiring these amino acids, we think that this explains these clinical symptoms of this ulcerating wounds of it eating away at your tissue. Well, if you think about it, at 37 degrees or higher than 34 degrees, it needs to chew up the surrounding protein in the flesh in order to give itself amino acids simply to replicate. So we think we're actually seeing... Oops. Is that the end? That's your second warning. <laughs> okay, right, so... <laughs> right. Okay. Okay, so uh, here's the protease. It's up at secretion. We think that's why it's eating away the tissue. And actually, when you look at the promoter region in this, between the human and insect pathogenic strains, there is a lot of divergence. So it... We can actually get to the molecular details of how it's evolving here. So, I'll just do the summary now. Um, so at 28 degrees, we get low light emission, limited mobility, uh, motility, and lives extracellularly. 37 in a human, we get high light emission, which burns up all the oxygen, because it's a very oxygen-hungry reaction. Uh, high motility, and it becomes intracellular. Carbohydrates used, not used. Multiple amino acids used, only three. See, here it can do oxidative phosphorylation, but here it switches to fermented respiration, probably because this light reaction is burning up all the oxygen, so there simply isn't any available for, for oxidative phosphorylation, so it probably has no choice. Quite why it's doing that, we don't know yet. Uh, what we see is it increases toxin gene expression, so it's using the same toxins that would against an insect, it just makes more of them. Right, so it's using... Uh, and also we see all the chaperones come on really highly, so it clearly is having problems folding its proteins. So that's why I think it's failing rather than deliberately evolved in this way. So, but all this is reflected with very few changes in gene expression. Okay, so it isn't that different, really, of the two, but it is getting around it somehow. So as I said, same tools, different job. So it uses the same toxins for an insect or a human, and the same defense molecules as well. So have I got time for this quickly? Yeah, as we had a bit of historical <laughs> perspective, is a bit more. So in the US Civil War, um, soldiers who were wounded on the battlefield were lying in cold mud basically for days before they were seen to. And what they noticed is soldiers whose wounds started to glow, they tended not to have, they, all their other infections went and they didn't have to have amputations. So they called it angel glow because they thought they were being blessed by the angels to save them. Um, and it's quite possible that they were, because this was happening in the areas where these photoagrams seemed to be endemic, is that the photoagrams were infecting them, producing all these antimicrobials, killing off everything, it was then self limiting, and the patient survived. So I just put a bit of a historical bent on it, and we do know that 37 degrees of light reaction goes through the roof. So it's quite possible that this explains this old mystery. And there you go, and slightly over time. And I'd like to thank a whole battery of wonderful people, millions of dead caterpillars who were harmed in the production of this. And uh, that's it, thank you very much.